Hi everyone, Alex here. I'd just like to take a moment to thank some... No, 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 that's not what we're doing today. No, today we are doing questions. Yes, I remember now. I know where I am. I know what's going on. So, I am going to be doing a Q&A session, a recorded video one. Ooh, I do have a face. Uh, and I'm going to be answering a bunch of questions that were asked during the Gaming and Giving event as a stretch bonus for people because we sort of smashed through all of our targets there. So, I'm going to be doing my best to go through all the questions that you all asked and try and give as many honest answers as I can. Uh, I haven't read any of them deliberately so that I can have a, a fresh response. I worry that some of them might be I can't tell you yet so I apologise for those in advance. Apart from that I just want to take a moment and say thank you to everyone who uh, donated and got us so far past our goals that is hugely appreciated and well if nothing else it is going to be a pleasure to be able to do my part. So without further ado I've got my questions here I'm going to start reading them. Tafiara, how am I doing? What a heavy question. How am I doing? Okay, that, yeah, let's start with the big ones. I'm good, I'm good, all right. I am quite tired at the moment, but in a good way. Uh, I would rather be busy than not. And a lot of it is because I'm doing lots of kind of sneaky things in the background that no one's allowed to know about yet. Uh, eventually you'll be able to, probably not even by the time this video comes out, but I am spending a lot less time out front and a lot more time kind of scheming in the background, which, if it all comes off, should be wonderful, and if it doesn't, I do get to, like, stand on a battlement and yell, CURSES! WHY? THEY CALLED ME MAD! etc. that kind of thing. So, we'll, we'll see how it goes, but in general, I'm good. I am taking more time to do anything other than work. Wrong Socks. How do I create simultaneously the worst and best characters for the one-hit episodes? Not shade, it's highly entertaining. Okay, let's address something here. This isn't a goal of mine. I don't try and be horrendous. I just am horrendous. It is a symptom of a couple of things. One is I like playing low charisma characters. Most people in games that have charisma as a dedicated stat will tend to dump it as a way of boosting their punching stats. Arr. Which is fine, but they tend to forget that low charisma needs to mean low charisma. What I like doing is finding ways to play low charisma that is not just being a dick to the players at the table, but is instead playing through the charisma of that character in the setting in a way that can be yeah chaos or whatever but isn't actually like actively against your players but i think part of it as well is i really like inverting i like the rogue who's bad at traps i like the uh the paladin who is really unvirtuous i like the wizard that isn't actually a wizard like there's, i've always wanted to play the character of uh, an orcish sort of barbarian or something similar who calls themselves wizard and has an axe that they call their wand and they cast bash and slice and things like that. I just like those sort of subversions so I think a lot of it is leaning into that as well. This one's from Not A Gentle Them. Alex please, I need to know about the Your Fault voice RQG 182 sounds without editing. So part of the All Your Fault stuff is it starting at a normal volume then coming down. That should have aired by this point but it's, it's sort of going all the way from like, you know, all your fault, 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 all your fault. Like that. I'm not sure what editing's been on the your fault stuff. It's not actually come out yet at the time I'm recording this, so it could be like completely nothing like the edited version. The edited version could be a, actually, you know, Good. Natalie F. Any advice on how to get allies for creative projects? That's a really good question. That is probably the most important les lesson I learned in my 20s. And until I learned that lesson, nothing was working for me. And I'm going to give a couple of pieces of advice on that one. One sounds horrendous. It's not as bad as it is, which is friends aren't allies. And to be clear, friends can also be allies, but not all friends are automatically allies. An ally is someone who is going to work with you to achieve your shared goal. You help them, they help you, you get where you're going. A friend is someone that you enjoy spending time with that, that sort of helps you out in that regard, right? But you can't conflate the two because they're not always the same. Uh, in terms of getting allies, there's a couple of pieces of advice I would use. One is you need to put yourself out there first. Um, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, which is you're more likely to get allies if you make something without allies and then it is picked up by them going oh i liked this i'd love to help you make more of this you don't need to assume 
that this is an ask, it is an allegiance, and allegiance is mutually beneficial. People, especially in the like the industry, are interested in mutual gain, and so if you facilitate that mutual gain, you're gonna do, you're gonna get further with that. Next question's from Marie. Apart from how to run a podcast, is there anything you've taken away from RQ Gaming about GMing or different playing styles? A few. GMing for performance isn't GMing for fun. Um, that sounds very miserable, but it, it's a different set of skills, and it is a different experience altogether. GMing for performance feels a lot more like encouraging railroading you would normally avoid as a play for fun. Pathfinder was always chosen as an expedience for me because it was just my new best. And if there's one thing that people will realise is that even then I don't know that system that well. It broadened my horizons in terms of what was available, especially the specials, because that was one where it was like, Ah, okay, and as I started broadening my horizons in terms of systems, I started to see a lot of the shortcomings of the systems I had known and the advantages, though, of the systems I've known as well. I think I've learned a lot of sensitivity stuff, actually, from Helen, Ben, Lydia especially, Bryn too, but I'd say it's very much like Helen's wheelhouse, that I was weak on, not in the sense of that I would run roughshod over my players, but I would do a lot of asking, are you okay? Which is very different from, say, red card, black card systems or whatever, that kind of thing you're using. So I'd say that that's pretty improved. What I'm learning is what my limits are, I think, currently. Uh, I think I'm, I'm running up against GM fatigue in a way where it'll be fine for the rest of the series, don't worry about that, but there's no version, and I'll say this now, there's no version where I would finish the, this and go, right, next campaign, and then go off on a new one with this... 500 episode thing that I've got pre-baked in my head and no, I don't have that. Eben Rose Taylor, are you a fan of Solarpunk? I'm really interested in the grungy aspect of it and I wanted to hear your thoughts since you tweeted about it before. I only recently discovered Solarpunk. Solarpunk, for people that don't know, is a subgenre engaged in optimistic, optimistic viewings of the future. Um, as distinct from Star Trek as it engages with considerations of environment and ecology better. It's the idea of what would happen if, I'll swear, why not? What would happen if humanity got its shit together and was like, you know what? I like plants. Do you like plants? Okay. Yeah, everyone's on board with plants. We should make sure there are plants in cities. We should do that instead of making cities, concrete deserts that form new oceans that native species need to tra traverse and things like that. Sci-fi used to look forward and used to see a future to aspire to. Sci-fi now looks forward and sees a future to avoid. In terms of the way that people consume those things, they consume them the same way. Cyberpunk was intended as a cautionary tale, and all everyone did is read it and went, I want the things that are in this, and started making iPhones, smartwatches, VR, cyberspace. And I'm not saying that those things are inherently bad, but I'm saying that the, the goal here was not to read cyberpunk and go cool i'd like all of the good bits and none of the bad bits oh i got all the good bits and all the bad bits oh no whereas if you go a bit further back sci-fi was very aspirational unfortunately it was very environmentally ignorant solar punk is interesting to me because i think that i'm gonna use words i don't normally use conceptually and spiritually people are hungry for hope and they are trying they are just starting to make it themselves which I respect, but it's not yet taken hold. I think it will. I am interested in solo punk. I would not say I am a fan yet because I don't think there has been a fulsome enough creation within that space that you can point to and go this. Ilaya, 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 Ilaya thinks. As Arky has grown as a company, how do you maintain or try to maintain the ethos with which you started the company? How do you and Hannah navigate the intersection of friendship and business with everyone who works with and for Arky? It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. And the only way I've managed so far is surrounding myself with allies and baking it into everything that you do. Reality and an ideal rarely mix, and it is spotting when there has to be some flex in one or the other. And that sounds a lot like compromise, 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 and you've lost your ideals. It's not that at all. It's more, it helps having stated values and being like, these are our values. Fostering good communication so that people feel they can call anyone up, even you, on those values. Separating out HR from myself so that if people have an issue with me, they can raise it with HR. That's a very valuable one. When it comes to the fan base side of things, it requires people to accept that a real solution takes time. You can't just magic it up. Systemic change and systemic safeguarding against negative change is a long, 
driven process of dedicated time, effort, and resources. It's just keeping it in mind at all times. You don't get the luxury of choosing to forget sometimes. Straw Cup asks, based off of Johnny's season two Alt Magnus titles, how many bees do you suspect have menaced Martin throughout the years? I do not understand that question. Eight. Based off nothing, eight. So her Stalitha? Either Stoha Stalita or Stalitha, I apologise for pronunciation. Freaking and Hope, have you ever considered that they're basically the creepy Chucker brothers? How much to me to you happened when they dragged a coffin up the stairs to the apartment? Yes. Yeah, like, a lot. We made a lot of jokes. It was in there right from the beginning. Yeah. Cheap. Creepy Chuckle Brothers is 100% on the money, and we even lent into it quite hard. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Gemma asks, can you talk a bit about your editing process? What you use, how you approach it, how your process has changed since starting RQ? Oh, that's a big question. I am going to let people know the guilty secret. I still use Audacity. I shouldn't. We have wildly outgrown it. Uh, in terms of my personal editing process, to go through very quickly, I am currently only mastering. The main thing that has changed since I started RQ is that loads of people now work on the editing. Gaming used to be me alone, it's now split at any one time between Lowry on vocal cuts, Tessa on soundscaping, sometimes Marissa, um, Jeffrey will work on specials, um, they do mastering as well, and we get other editors in as well, and then I master on top of that as well. So you've taken a team of me to a team of like eight. In terms of my personal process, all I can talk about is mastering where the stems are brought in. So a stem being uh, a layer. So like if you have three characters and they're in a bus, your stems would be character one, character two, character three, wheels on the road, engine, uh, air conditioning, wind running past the window, radio, as an example. So that's eight stems. So I get all the stems, listen to it, as people have got it as close as I can, and then what I do is go, that needs tweaking, that needs tweaking, let's stretch that out, let's condense that down, let's stretch that out. Um, I need updated credits here because a different person's working on it. I need to um, change the levels between the stems so that the, the vocals pop more. Uh, that sound effect doesn't really work, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that out, I'm going to get a different sound effect, I'm going to insert that in, in its place. That sound effect is good, but it's pitched too high, and I know that blah blah blah. Magnus is the last of the shows where it's stored in my head and Elizabeth's head, to be clear. Elizabeth's almost has done the vast majority of the soundscaping for uh, season five, and I think she was doing season, so she was even doing a chunk of the soundscaping for season four as well, although that was a bit more um, work with me rather than like working and then it passing to me. Elizabeth's better at soundscaping than I am at this point, and frankly, that question should be asked to her because she will, she will have a more in-depth answer. A lot of what comes to me is directorial tweaking. Oh, I know that Peter Lucas uses this static um, you've put in a close approximation, but I actually can make sure it's the correct pitch, blah, blah, blah. It's gone from a hundred macro changes to a thousand tiny micro changes of a tenth of a second to just get everything consistent, I guess. Alex Bebbington asked, did you listen to the mechanism before meeting Johnny or because you met him? Mechanisms had been recommended to me prior to me meeting Johnny. I met Johnny at a completely uncreative workplace that I hated. It was the night work that I did so that I could do this on the other weeks. I then went and saw the mechanisms because I knew Johnny was already working in Edinburgh. I'll be honest, because Johnny knows this. Had a bit of time to kill, and it's like there are worse things you can do in Edinburgh than going watching something that was recommended. And then I saw the first mechanisms thing and went, oh, this is really good. Damn, this is really, really good. So then I bought every album they had at the door, uh, listened to all of them, and after that was when I approached Johnny going, we should work together. I don't care how, but we should. That's the order of events. Although the time frame between those elements is fuzzy to me. I'd have to, I'd have to dig through diaries or something to find that. Chris Tsune asks, do you enjoy thunderstorms? Yes. Do you have a favorite type of waveform? Vocals, laughter, SFX, music. I have favorite words in waveforms. I hate the word um, because I can recognize an um at a glance on a waveform, and I know that's an extra bit of work to cut it out. I actually don't like the waveform of laughter, ironically. I really like a good explosion waveform that's been treated properly but i think a lot of this is actually what i like and dislike is more what is and isn't work i'd say out of every performer we've had frank voss zim as i know them has probably the best waveform to look at very smooth very well balanced between different frequencies but that's a very 
odd question. Number nine asks, do you feel like a celebrity or someone famous? If yes, how do you feel about it? No? Not even slightly. I feel like people think I am, if that makes sense. So I encounter a lot of people who treat me like I am, like on, on the fan side of things. I don't, honestly. Um, I still feel like I'm just chucking stuff into a void and that void happens to reply back. Here's one, here's one. We still get, even though we've had to like ask to stop due to like pandemic and like risks associated, blah, 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 fan mail. And I hate with a passion not being able to reply because of the volume where I originally told myself I was always going to, you know, respond to fan mail properly because people are taking the time to contact you. You can't, it's so much. And at some point I had to be like, I guess I'll just, get round to this. So I'm going to use this opportunity the same way I always do, which is if I have not replied to your fan mail, it has been read. I guarantee you. And I guarantee you it has been like shared with people. And I guarantee you if I could reply to all of it, I would. Queenie, do you have any advice for someone who wants to try game mastering for the first time? Just do it. It's easier than you think. Don't agonize. Just do it. I would say if you're able to have a module that has been pre-planned, so like something that's pre-made, go with that there's a reason that they exist there they're laid out and it just gives you that safety net i would say as well don't overestimate the challenge if your players are having fun and there is an rpg involved you are an excellent gm that's it probably i'd say don't start long form the first game i ever gm'd ran for 70 sessions or something because i it's me i'm very extra everything i do has to be or not at all have an npc they'll like have an npc they won't like have a fight that they will absolutely boss and have a fight that they'll really really struggle on all the rest is set dressing really cinephoria no sorry sinphoria asks given that lolong doesn't always have the manners i have to ask did bertie sword have a name and if so what was it the blade of mcguffingham never had a name beyond the blade of mcguffingham i can tell you why though and it's because all of the uh mcguffinghams were so arrogant that the idea of letting the sword have a name and thus gain a reputation of its own was abhorrent so as a result the blade of mcguffingham has never had a name might have a name now because brutor is not that arrogant but no uh good question it didn't pizza doc hey alex what is your netflix and chill mine right i at some point may have admitted publicly that I thought Netflix and chill meant watching Netflix and chilling. If I say ever say Netflix and chill again, I will mean watching Netflix and chilling. However, I probably won't say it ever again in a, a, a forum with people who don't know me very, very well because I now know what that means. And it's, it's rude. But what, what's my downtime? I play single player games mostly if I get downtime, when I'm not like going outside or whatever for walks, because I have to do that just for health, if nothing else, because otherwise I'd be a screen all day, every day. I like hiking a lot, but in terms of like day to day, I play games because I sh I can't switch off like at all. It might be a neurochemistry thing, I don't know, but I, I, I just run at full speed all the time. And so the only way that I can mitigate that is if I play a game, it engages, and certain types of game as well, it engages that part of me and lets it run and run and run, but in a way that doesn't exhaust me. Puzzles I don't do uh, because it doesn't engage that. I can worry about stuff at the same time as doing a puzzle. But if a game is engaging and immersive enough, I can't worry and immerse myself. Uh, and I find games are more immersive than film and TV for that regard sorry in that regard so yeah i'd say i play i play single player games um as a way of doing that but i've not had a lot of downtime over the last couple of years so my netflix and chill is normally working late caffeine now asks how did you develop the idea of the aurora borealis's waves of wild magic have you seen the aurora borealis that's clearly wild magic it's just magnet magic it's because wild magic's brilliant like wild magic's really interesting to me and it's underused and there was one that i wanted to do and i have never done in the campaign and i won't like categorically we're in the end game now i, I don't have the time which was a table of when magic fails right and th there's a standard table which you can roll and it's like oh this slightly strange things happen and then at 100 often it's things like you know gm's discretion so someone generated another table of 100 which says if you roll 100 on your 100 side on your d100 roll on this table and that table's like you know summon d100 corgis everyone gains five levels in a class they aren't part of all colors within a thousand mile are randomized permanently trees 
animals, people, I got all of it randomised. The sky randomised. And that always stuck with me as something that's just stupid and glorious. And that's actually what got me looking at the wild magic stuff. And it's because wild magic's interesting. And it opens the door for the meritocratic lies of anything that is not under our control is wild, untamable, and utterly inhospitable. Yami Kakyu asks, how do you come up with the voices for all your NPCs? Do you have an idea when creating them or wait until they're being used? Little column A, little column B. If it's an NPC I wasn't planning, you just roll with it, make it work. A lot of NPCs are bad impressions is, a, is one that I suggest the best is, are you bad at impressions? Congratulations. If you're bad at impressions, you're very good at NPC voices. Just make characters bad impressions. The priest from the Cult of Poseidon, who I thought would turn up more, I gave my Christopher Lee. He's down here, and if you listen, he has a very Christopher Lee vibe. So as a result, a lot of them are just bad impressions. Uh, there's one that I'll do now, which uh, I've yet to find a way to work in, but still could work in is, oh, I really want Walken. I want my bad Walken to be as a character. I want him to be like, hey, it's me, King Arthur. Hey, I got a sword, you know. It's just cool. I'd love, I'd love uh, a bad walking impression to turn up in gaming, but I'm kind of running out of opportunities at this point. But that's that's my advice, I guess, for how to come up with them. Bora K asks, how do you feel about your time working with Johnny drawing to a close? Oh, thank God he's gone, right? God! No, he's an ally, exactly like I was talking about. He's someone who cares about the right stuff, who works hard and so will stay an ally. We're going to end up working on stuff in the future. That I promise. Um, and... It's been slightly odd, I'll admit, because we finished Magnus recordings now. So I have less FaceTime, so that's a bit odd. But I've had so much FaceTime for so long, and I listen to his voice multiple hours a day sometimes that I don't miss him yet. Uh, but I think that's going to change. Um, it's starting to feel a little odd, where we'll we'll have like a meeting and I'll be like, oh, hey, how are you going? And it's like, oh, it's been two weeks what's actually happened in your life as opposed to it's been two hours. I know that his last recording was wildly underwhelming because we were having lots of technical issues on the call because we we're recording remotely due to pandemic and he basically was like I'm not gonna I'm not even gonna pretend to be sad there's no way this is my last this isn't gonna be my last at all so as a result he was just super blasé about it and only yesterday I think it was I was like you're done I don't think there's any pickups for that you're actually done and he's like oh all right. Swelling Skies asks, how do you make sure the party actually connects the dots between the clues? Have there been any instances of the party missing something important and how did you handle that? Yes. How do I ensure the party actually connects the dots? I don't. I give up. Just, there's, you can't. It's never going to happen. So what I do at this point is I put save points, I guess? So a save point is the bank vault in Cairo was a save point. So that was one where any info I needed them to have had that they did not have by that point was in that save point. Showings was another save point. Any info I needed them to have that they did not have by that point by virtue of just going off in a random direction, I would have put in showings. Putting those save points where it's like it's a, a, a law repository intermittently is very useful and I use that quite a lot. And so that's my sort of trick, I guess. Stroker asks, how do you take your tea? I like tea. I'm a child. I drink, I drink water and pop and juice. I like mint teas and things like that. And I like herbal teas, but I, I don't drink breakfast tea. I don't drink normal tea. There is no normality in my life. Uh, yeah, don't drink, don't, sorry. Toys are cuss or toys are sus? I think toys are cuss, which is a nice name. How long have you been directing for? I started directing for theater non-professionally at age 14 because I went to a school that allowed students to direct their school plays. I did a lot of performing. I then did performing and directing at the same time. The reason that I moved into directing is I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> you know the phrase, uh, lead, follow, or get out of the way. I found out uh, I was better at leading than I was at following, and I'm very bad at getting out of the way. Although I'm a bit weird. My, my, my background's a bit of a mushed mashup between writing, directing, and performing, um, with writing and directing probably being the two things I'm best at and performing, I'm okay at. How long have I been directing? More than a decade. A lot more than- wait, can it reveal my age here? Like 17 years, give or take? Oh no! Oh no, I'm so old! 
silver arsonist. If there was only one colour you could see for the rest of your life, what would it be? It's an interesting question. Because if you can only see one colour, does that mean that I can't see shades of grey? Because in that situation then, what would end up happening is everything would just be like mono red or whatever, so you can't see. You're just seeing the colour red. So as a result, the question I suppose is immaterial. Black, why not? Because you, you can't distinguish between things. Assuming that I can see like, say black uh, shades of grey and a colour, probably red? Red's a useful colour. <laughs> There you go. Cal asks, if you could change the result of a single dice roll in RQ Gaming past, what would it be and why? Oh, there's a few. I'd have liked to have captured them for Eiffel's Folly. That would have been fun. I would have liked to petrify someone with the Medusa. That would have been fun. And then you wouldn't have had the whole Rome side quest properly. Not really. I would like more of my bosses to have got a hit in. And they've rolled quite poorly and the group has rolled quite high so there's a few more special abilities that you will never see that i would want to go off like the medusa i guess daughter of prospero asks i would love to know more about how you approach directing and why that approach works for you in specific how do you handle episodes where martin reads statements or literally has a conversation with himself do you direct yourself or do you bring in someone like mr sims to be an outside eye so to speak uh, i just do it i don't rely on an external eye i, I just do it and then rely on my own self-knowledge i guess for a laugh uh, martin talking to himself was recorded a lot like here's normal martin Here's different Martin. Normal Martin, different Martin. And I spent the whole time bouncing between the mic like that just to get different headspaces. But no, I, I, I don't have other people direct me. In terms of my approach, generally, I'm quite specific. I spend less time diving into how did your character eat breakfast in the year 1989 and spend a lot more time like, okay, can you up your intonation here? Can you change your pacing there? This is too slow. Um, you put a question on there. It's not a question. Can you deliver it forcefully? It's very materialistic as opposed to conceptual. Uh, that's my style. Emma asks, I've just graduated from uni as an actor and I'm very interested in voice acting. Do you have any general advice on getting into the field? Check out the audio drama subreddit. There's a lot of people offering work there. Join every single organization like Fiverr and whatever and check yourself. Make a project yourself because that will both teach you better mic etiquette, the process so that you are better at providing directors and producers what it is that they actually want because you'll have been one yourself and you'll understand. Make sure you have a vocal reel doesn't have to change the world you don't need to pay thousands of pounds for it but i need to hear your range if i can't hear your range it's, it's not going to do well i don't even need to hear your range in professional from my perspective i don't really care if you're a professional or not i care if you can act video reel is helpful as well but for vocal work obviously vocal reel will do it yeah i'd say your best bet is to do your own project that you can then draw a vocal reel from something small something finite it'll teach you a lot and then get on all of those things and yeah check out Space is dedicated to podcasting. I'd say 50% of the time they're saying, I need a performer. I can't give advice on how to like break through into like big scale high end voice acting because I'm, I'm not one. But I, I'm, it's not like I'm on The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. M asks, favorite Lord of the Rings character and why? Oh, it changes over the years. Oh, it changes over the years. I like Aragorn. I know it's the easy choice, but I like Aragorn. I like a character that's like, I'm here and I'm doing it because it needs to be done not because I want power. Aragorn doesn't want to be in charge, but he is. So he does the best that he can over and over again. And I like that. Uh, and I like that he values people. He's someone who, if he orders 10,000 people to go march, knowing that they're going to die, he'd do it because it's the right call and it will save billions. But he would never, ever, ever stop beating himself up for having done that. And that's important. It's, there's a moral integrity to the character. Sam as well, actually as in Frodo's Sam, has a similar vibe. Actually, weirdly enough, I don't think a lot of people notice it, but it's that meme, you know, the fellowship at 100% strength and it's everyone and it's the fellowship at 99% and it's Aragorn and Sam. Yeah, it's that. It's They both have strength of character. I think I have more respect for Sam because that's someone who also doesn't have any skills or training. He's just like, I'll do it. Why? Because I'm the one who's here. That I'm on board with. That's something that is in Martin in Magnus. It's the same quality. I think Aragorn is a, li is a little bit of the sexier character because he's got a big sword, you know, blah, blah, blah. But they still have that fundamental thing and that's the thing that I really, uh, I really connect with, I guess, as a character. Yeah, probably, probably, probably Aragorn. I'd say when I was younger, Legolas, because he could ride a shield and fire loads of bows. And did you see how I get on that horse? That's ridiculous. But now it's kind of Kind of Aragorn, Sam. Megrose asks, have there been any moments in recording where everyone has cracked up and you've had to stop so you can get it together? Oh, countless. What's your favourite memory of this? Trigger's broom. 
We were talking about Theseus' ship, which is a philosophical argument that goes, Theseus has a ship, and he's sailing the ship, and he hits a rock, so they make port, and they uh, put some replacement plex on, they set off. He hits another rock, does it again, he's bad at driving. Uh, gets eaten by a Charybdis at one point, or whatever, so they have to replace a whole half of the ship. The mass falls down at one point, so they replace it. And at some point, he finally comes into port at the other end, and no part of that ship is what was once there. Still Theseus' ship though, right? Yeah, of course. What happens if someone then goes and gets all the other bits and assembles them together as a ship next to the original? Which one is Theseus' ship? And it's it's a, it's meant to be a question that has no answer. The kind of, kind of accepted answer is both. One is talking about the testament of the journey and that something is defined by its journey and the other is talking about the thing is the thing, I guess. But we were trying to explain that, at which point it was like, it's like Trigger's broom, which is an Only Fools and Horses reference, because they make a gag of that, where it's like, oh, this is my broom, I've had it, you know, 40 years, and they're like, wow, how'd you get a broom to last 40 years? Well, I had to replace the handle at some point. Okay, fair enough. And then, like, 10 years ago, I had to replace the uh, the actual brush. Right, but you've had that 40 years. Yeah, and it's never broken. Like, it's, it's a gag on that. And it was the fact that um, the only way Bryn conceptualized it was with was with a pop group that kept changing members and i've forgotten the pop group now that was funny that was funny uh, that one's probably my favorite I, lo I, I lost my mind at that one i couldn't stop laughing at that one but there's there's countless the professional rookie asks if you had to recast yourself as any character from the magnus archives who you haven't already voiced who would you want to play and it really worked like that so i'll, I'll answer it fairly but I, I i'm not hankering necessarily after roles like that probably elias there's a lot of me in elias where Johnny will write something and I'll go, you know what, that could be shittier. So yeah, I think Elias would probably be quite fun, because it's always fun being the villain, isn't it? JJ Hunter asks, do you have a growing periodic table of character types in the back of your head? What kinds of character types have been most... have you been having the most fun with lately, either as types you play yourself or ones you've been playing off of? Do you have different favourite character types in RPG versus in script writing? That's a lot. Do you have a growing periodic table of character types in the back of your head? Yes. What kinds of character types have you been having the most fun with recently, either as types you play or others you've been playing off of? I've been enjoying capable but chill, and I've not really been doing that much in RQ stuff. Because I'm such an extra person, I've been enjoying in the back of my head playing around with stuff where this person's really, really cool, but they don't really have anything to prove, which is something I do. I always have to prove myself because that's just baked into me. Youngest child, am I right? There's something fun about the character being like, just because they know the answer to the question doesn't mean they volunteer the answer because someone else might have a better answer. Like that kind of chill, capable-ness is nice. And it's also a rarity in the circles that I move in, which quite performer heavy because all performers have something to prove. We do, that's what a performer is. They're someone who goes out and proves themselves. So you are less likely to encounter characters that don't have some element of that because of where they're being created from do i have favorite tarot types in rpgs versus in script writing oh yeah 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 in script writing i like characters who have nothing going for them and then do it anyway because it's a job that needs to be done do you have a favorite character type in rpgs i like martial types i like martial types in a world where people can explode things with a thought i like someone who's like screw you i can't do that but i got a stick mm! like that's nice i like that i love straight man as well uh i love being the only mundane, I don't know, human character in a party that consists entirely of illithid dragonborn hybrids who are both warlocks and paladins and can see time and taste love or whatever. I like being the normal one. Normal. I like being the one there who's just very, very, like, pointedly mundane. That's a very fun one to play because you're not belittling anyone who's around there you're like wow that's really really impressive what have you got hammer that, that's it i got hammer i like that that's fun i enjoy playing that live doodles asks as a relatively new gm who keeps all their campaign notes in a single word document i was wondering if you had any tips on preparing for individual rpg sessions is there a structure you like to follow to keep organized i wish god i wish that would require your players to be predictable in any kind of way you know what i might do i'm gonna bring up what my current prep is i'm not going to screen share it uh, and i'm not going to tell you the specific components but i will tell you right now what i am working off as a document in terms of headings so what i do is i generate a document for the area that they're going to be in i don't know damascus uh with the broad points that are fixed points that will trigger in that world i keep a record of the last place they've been the important bits that will have consequences 
I keep a detailed record of where they currently are, and then I keep a preliminary record of what is going to happen in the next area I think they're likely to go to, or the next, I'll have to prepare multiple if it's a branching path, and I will put little markers next to things I think they're likely to impact. What I have is I have last episode, which is basically saying, because it's a performance one, literally what happened in last episode so that I don't forget, and then I'll have this recording plan. And this recording plan says the things that I know need to happen in this episode, otherwise we're falling behind. And those are fixed points combined with follow-ons from what happened last episode, okay? I then have my next area, which has... Very difficult to talk about without talking about it. What I'm working from here is I have my recording plan, which is events that have to happen in this recording based on last episode and what's going to be happening next episode and so on. I then have all future events that I know are going to have to happen laid out in the next section so that if I am improvising I can look ahead to what needs to happen look at what is happening and connect those two dots so that my improv never takes me off in a random direction it always loops back into what's planned rather than prepare big bosses often what I'll do is I will collect all the monsters that are CR appropriate and environmental hazards that are CR appropriate and just put them in a bucket in a document with a URL link to where I can connect them or a page reference or whatever so that I can improvise an encounter if needed. As an example, in Prague, the encounter bucket was very undead heavy so that if they went off in a random direction, I could be like, okay, cool, uh, I'll take that zombie, that ghost, slap them together, there's an encounter and you can do it quickly on the fly. It's very useful. It's a great trick. I don't think anyone taught it me. I just started doing it out of necessity. Um, for big bosses, what I'll do is I'll know what I want the boss to be, but all of the fluff around it will also be improvisational. So in the Shoin dungeon, I knew Shoin, I am Mecha Shoin, was the thing. But the little blob things that make people... It never went off. So annoyed. The blobs that would make people laugh hysterically and drop all their stuff was from the encounter bank, where I went, okay, who's in, Who's going to be in that room? Everyone's going to be in that room. I need to up the CR. Let's take this, this, and this. And I actually do it a lot on the fly. After the encounter bank, I have my trackers. So that is player characters, will, thought, blah, 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 enemy stuff, ally stuff, initiative order, da, 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 all my trackers. But I also carry additional trackers, which are major and minor NPC trackers, where it's like characters that aren't here, but are alive in the world. What is Earhart doing right now? That's on the tracker. What is Einstein doing right now? It's on the tracker. And then when I move location, I update that tracker and I update that tracker if the characters have done something that would affect them directly. I then tend to have warnings and wish list. So warning and wish list is things I need to be careful of that are coming up to make sure that I do them right. I'll invent something. Let's say Bryn was phobic of cats and people were going to something in world. This doesn't exist in Arcade Gaming. So we're going to something in world that was established to be cat based. That's a warning where I'm like, watch out. Don't forget this. Here is your workaround if it's coming up. And the wish list is things I know player characters will just go crazy for. They'll love it. Um, so that one would be Showing's enormous alchemy kit should have been a wishlist item that didn't come off. That should have been ideally something that Cell could be like, oh, I can make anything I want. <laughs> but obviously I messed around with it a little bit, but that's a good example of sort of warnings and wishlist. After that, I have my context. So context is everything that is established in world laid out in order of, I suppose, faction. So it's like, Ursons is one that I could share because that's already come out. And it's like, you know, who was that council? Who are their gods? What's their cosmology? Um, beliefs on the afterlife, family, economy, it's all there. And you can modify this based on what the player characters are doing. I have a section on props. So props is one where it is items not to lose track of. Less MacGuffins. MacGuffins your plot orients around, but it's more to ensure world consistency and make sure that those items don't fizzle out i know where the diary is you know i know where edison's notebook uh is obviously timelines uh comes next so that's like here are the things that have happened here are the things i expect to happen and when and then broadly speaking that's it straw cup asks what are some of your favorite words i went through a phase from age 12 to age 22 where every single thing i had ever worked on had to have the word maelstrom on and at 22 i realized that it'd become a thing so i have made sure or I have endeavoured to ensure that every single thing I've ever worked on has the word maelstrom in at some point. I particularly like erinaceous definition. Relating to or resembling 
hedgehogs. So like a brush could be, oh, what a very erinaceous brush. Uh, I like that. People should say the word indubitably more. Faf's a great word. Faf is one of those beautiful words that sounds like the thing it describes, even though the thing it describes doesn't have a word. Same for words like glint as well. I love anything that sounds like what something should sound like if it had a sound. Glint. Boys of Stone on Twitter asks, what would each of the Magnus Archive's main characters dress up as for Halloween? Each other. They would go to Halloween and then have a laugh pretending to be each other. That was easy. Random wonder, what's a silly little thing that brings you delight? I have delight in my life, just give me a second. Natural 20s. I like them. They can stay. Natural ones I actually like more. <laughs> okay, here you go. There's a TV advert on uh, British TV, broadcast TV, which is terrible. And it's advertising toothpaste. And honest to God, it's like, you know, this toothpaste will blah, 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 blah. And it has a performer, like, literally, like, grab a piece of toothpaste, put it down and go, toothpaste. And it's just the joy, <laughs> the deep, fundamental excitement joy on her face as she goes toothpaste cracks me up every time I see it it's just the toothpaste I don't know why it's a, an in jokey thing but no matter how bad it is if I see the toothpaste ad I cannot help but laugh because that performer gave it everything that's an Oscar winning toothpaste performance right there curator Q asked what's something amazing you've done during the creation of any rustical content that you would really like the chance to brag about or brag about on someone else's behalf. I wouldn't brag about on stuff at my end, but in terms of bragging about other people, Elizabeth's done a lot of really, really good work this year for season five Magnus Sound Design that people pay attention to the big stuff, but they don't pay attention to the little stuff. Sound design on the episode where John is in a boat, I think it's called a drift, 194, is very good. It's very, very good and people tend to be like, oh, I loved that monster, because it's the big shiny thing that grabs your attention. But if you go back and listen to season five for the little stuff, the footsteps, the uh, the cloth rustles, that's hours and hours of work. The very similitude of audio in season five was deliberately increased as a directorial point that Elizabeth has facilitated and actually made work to help offset the absolutely bananas like world that they're moving through and she smashed it out of the park there. Other things I want to brag about, April. April has gone from a fresh starter to like our head of production in an astonishing short space of time. And I'm gonna gush in a way that's gonna embarrass April. She opens her interview going, hi, I'm really, really sorry. My signal might be a bit patchy. There's actually an ongoing hurricane right now. So I've had to make alternate arrangements in order to attend this call. And she was still there early. She attended her first interview in a hurricane didn't even miss a beat like that's impressive broader than that the whole team callum's been smashing it in in his way everyone has it's it's really difficult to draw attention to stuff because the the, the real truth of it is the stuff that you aren't seeing the back end stuff the hard work autumn autumn's been doing so much work community side to help out and you've had the mods the mods are a perfect example like they're working their conkers off just trying to make things as fun for fans as they can be and it's all of the stuff everyone always asks oh you know what are you proud about on this production i think truthfully the thing i'm most proud of is the fan end you rarely see but at the business end astounds people it's the invisible infrastructure stuff it's people putting the work in putting the time in and like doing a good job and in a way that they know isn't going to get yelled from a rooftop, but will allow something really special to come out the other end. And that's been true for everyone in the company. If I could magically just let people know how much people care, that'd be something I want to brag about. Smiley asks, what's the most entertaining internet rabbit hole you've gone down because of Magnus and or RQG? I've done a lot of deep dives. Uh, I can't help myself. Nuclear semiotics. Lydia hates me because I've always gone about it. I discovered nuclear semiotics by virtue of research into rustical gaming. Nuclear semiotics is the study of language and how to transfer meaning uh, tied to how do you do that over long time periods. So for instance, with nuclear waste, how do you put a warning on nuclear waste that you know will last the 5,000 years or whatever it takes for that nuclear waste to stop being a thing and that's where you get phrases like there is no honor here because you don't want to say something's buried here because people go oh what and dig it up you don't want to say uh 
this is powerful because then people are like ah a weapon so there is no honor here was the most concise way they could find of doing it and like nuclear semiotics got into the way of like we should genetically modify cats what yeah if we genetically modify cats to glow in the uh, presence of radiation people will over time recognize that if the and introduce those cats into the wild population uh, because if then people see a glowing cat they will eventually learn to associate glowing cat with death because of that superstition and you can rely on the superstition and the glowing cats to ward people away fabulous idea horrible consequences environmentally and morally speaking like you're introducing a an engineered species into the wild but my point is is that thing it's fascinating to me like how do you how, how do you send a message through time i guess um, but yeah, nuclear semiotics, look at it beyond the just the linguistic stuff into the real kooky stuff, where like most of it came down to found a religion about it. Religions hold up really well over time. That's nuclear semiotics, really interesting. What's the most unexpected thing a player has done in character while you've been DMing, DMing, -ing? how do you handle it? Uh, Grizzop refusing to go to Rome. Splitting the party over something so mass, like over such a massive distance was an absolute nightmare and you saw how I handled it. Uh, time jump. <laughs> no, uh, in, in fairness, um, it is obvious how I handled it, but yeah, Gri Grizzop splitting off was... I'll, I'll be honest, it was quite annoying. It was like, oh God, can we the party not just deal with this thing first and then go to Rome, or go to Rome and then come to this thing later? Can we not... Oh, okay, alright, I'll make that work, that's fine. That's probably it, if I'm honest. So how did you handle it? Poorly! I handled it poorly. <laughs> mile after mile asks, what's the stupidest and or smartest thing Casper has done? Smartest thing, he's very good at thieving. I've told, I've said this story before, um, you know, most people get fed like a bird or something like that because their cat thinks that they're too rubbish at hunting for themselves. Casper thinks I'm that much of a write-off that I received anonymously from him with no explanation, a cooked marinated pork chop with a nice uh, cheese glaze. We'll never forget that. The stupidest thing Casper's ever done. He now believes that food isn't in his bowl unless we say it is, even though it's there. He's going through a weird habit where he'll meow and meow and meow and meow until we go down and watch him eat. And it's only when he sees that we see the food that he believes it's there. I don't know why. Florana asks, what's your favourite RQG special? Beowulf. Beowulf was fun. It was... It was horrendous and i loved it mile after mile what's your favorite DD or pathfinder character you've ever played including or in including non-rqg games i played a uh elven necromancer that was fun uh lawful evil necromancer where everything had to be in service of uh eventually gaining control of just about everything but in a way that wasn't being a uh, wasn't being a dick to players it was just um going ridiculous but the e the extra levels that i went to that no one else even was aware of apart from the gm where it was like starting to build an entire tunnel network underneath the c city we were occupying just in case i needed it populating it with loads of undead minions on guard at the intersections just in case i needed them so that at a moment's notice i could go and then like skeletons would crawl out of every single like manhole cover and stuff like that that was fun that was fun. I quite like. I, I'll I'll definitely play necromancers in the future. It turns out I'm quite a necromancy kind of person. JJ Hunter asks, when you were early career, what skill sets did you deliberately set out to acquire, and how did you find jobs and other opportunities to develop those skill sets in a structured way? Um, hard skills. So I've been blessed with soft skills anyway. I'm fairly good at talking. I'm fairly good at like convincing people like of what can be achieved. Do you know what I mean? I'm good at I'm good at laying out the vision and saying, look, if we do this, we can get this. Hard skills are the seller. If you have no hard skills, you're gonna very struggle to sell yourself. You'd be astonished how many people will listen when it's like, I'll be a producer on your show. I'm very, very good at organization, cool. And I can deconstruct and construct a microphone from scratch. Oh. Oh, okay. So what I did is um when I was at university I made sure that in the theatre work that I was doing, I wasn't just doing theatre. I learned all of the techniques of lighting. I learned all of the technicals of audio. I learned all of the technicals of uh, the stage management side and blah, blah, blah. Hard technical skills are valuable in a performer and they're valuable in creatives full stop. A director who knows how all of the elements work in detail is a better director than one who goes, figure it out. Uh, it's nice to be able to sit in a room and go, What's this missing? What's this missing? Oh, we're using a spot instead of a Fresnel. Okay, can we swap to a Fresnel with like a number 37 gel or something? And that'll, that'll probably sort it out. That's where you can skip huge amounts of faff and subcommittee discussion and just be like, this is the solution and be right. Nero asks, who is your favorite NPC member of Hamid's family? The twins. The twins that are a different age. There you go. That was easy. I love them. I love them to bits. Bryn. 
Is that Bryn Bryn? I think it is. Why do you keep making enemies with magic immunity or fire immunity? It's so mean, Alex. Because, because you destroy everything that I put in front of you, Bryn, all the time. No matter what I put in front of you, you annihilate it. The only time a creature has ever managed to get a special ability off against you has been when it is literally immune to everything that you can do. Otherwise, they just die immediately. I think part of it as well is because we've been struggling having to do a lot of theatre of the mind because of remote recording and so on, and due to my lack of ability to do the full prep required for stuff like Roll20, is I can't make encounters with like 7, 8, 12 different enemies and coordinate it properly. So as a result, I have to make those individual enemies tougher. Um, I would say that that phase has passed because you've now entered a sort of new band of power within the Pathfinder mechanics, so I can just throw more vicious things at you and then it'll balance itself out. But Bryn is right. There was a phase where showing was the entire entire show in arc was deliberately built to bring to play a bunch of constructs that are immune to magic and force people to think differently um and to do stuff like mess around with stuff to do with cobbles and so on so as a result yeah like that's a fair call out from Bryn, but i also think we've left that behind a little bit stark on reality ask alex i know this is a hard one but if you weren't at all involved in the creation of the magus archives what do you think would you think of the show and what would be your favorite episode Oh, no, no, no. Okay, that's difficult. That's a good question. My favourite episode would still be something like... It's one that no one ever really likes, like the Piper. Uh, just because, I don't know, it speaks to me. A lot of the ones to do with that. There's a few in there that speak to me. The Piper, I think it's a buried one where it's just someone just drowning under, like, the paperwork of their life. Obviously, Lost John Cave, that, that, that resonates. I'm not claustrophobic at all, but that one's that, that just came together nicely. I don't think I'd probably listen to it. If I'm, if I'm being brutally, brutally honest, I would respect the craft of it, and I'd be like... That is a well-written piece. That is that is a well-written made thing. That is a well-constructed thing. But horror does not occupy that bit of my brain that needs occupying so that I can chill in quite the same way that other things do because it's too codified and formulaic as a genre. So as a result, I am not engaged enough because I know when the beats are coming because you can feel them. You feel them in your chest. You feel that rhythm. It's that, you know, and he opened the door and beat, beat, beat. There he is. Like, there's just, there's a correct and an incorrect answer for, like, how horror is executed a lot of the time. So as a result, it doesn't really occupy it in that way. So I'd like it, I'd respect it, and I'd want to work with the people who made it, but... I don't think I'd listen to it for pleasure. I probably wouldn't listen to like the finales and stuff like that for pleasure. But I know that's an odd thing to say because they say make the thing that you want to listen to. But I don't know how much of that is born of the fact that I've been doing Magnus for so long. It could be that if I wasn't doing Magnus, I'd be all over Magnus because that bit of me hasn't been fed. So it's, it's sort of an impossible question to really answer. Beatnik asks, Often when I write or RP, I learn new things about myself. What have you learned about yourself through your writing and your characters? <laughs> uh, Martin Pratt is aware of this one. I cannot help but build things. It's a compulsion. I was playing in a game with Martin, our head of, sorry, our technical officer. I was playing in a game with Martin and um, founded a business. Didn't mean to, didn't want to, still made a business because I saw an opportunity and was like, why is no one doing this? And then like five RP sessions later, I'm running a business and I don't want to. It wasn't my plan. I didn't intend to. I was just like, why haven't people connected these dots? What's If you just do this and this, you can solve both of these people's problems and suddenly I run a business. I want to run a business. I, I, I want to be a glorified, like, gunship that just flies through the world shooting problems. I think that's what I've learned about myself is I can't help myself. I've also learned that I don't actually have any need to be in charge and I know that sounds very contrary to what people might think. I very often end up in charge but I don't anymore feel a need to prove that I can be I guess. Like that that need has sort of died where it's like look I if someone else is willing to be the face of the party, you do it. You, off you go. You go be the face of the party and I'll just be here exploding things and that's fine. Alex Yuso says, what do you think the plural of Alex should be? Alipodes. Unless you're talking like plural and um, like collective noun. You know, what do you think the collective noun of Alex would be? That'd be something more along the line of uh, a faff. A faff of Alex's probably. Strawcup asks, in a post-COVID world, you're given a month-long holiday and an unlimited budget. Where in the world do you go and what do you do? I would go to the Canadian wilds or something like that in a cabin and just live off the land for a month. And I don't mean, like, I'm talking like the glamping style thing where it's like, it's a cabin and like, I'm fetching firewood. I'm not sowing the fields because that's 
backbreaking labor but yeah that it'd be it'd be a rest away from everyone and there is a secret house elf who prepares meals and then magically disappears uh, and does all of the cleaning and all of the pot washing that's what i do weirdly enough during pandemic i am hankering less for lots of interaction with people than because i've had to spin up the business side so much i'm having con i'm talking all day every day so yeah probably that if i'm honest nb kiddo nb kiddo asks have you ever had a supernatural ghostly experience of your own and or do you believe in ghosts like in real life i have not and i have actively sought them out i have done things that people who are afraid of ghosts would be terrified of um i've gone not deliberately like sort them out but anytime there has been an opportunity for me to force a spooky event i have done so they go oh and careful of that floor that's got the haunted room at which point i'll go give me the haunted room please who don't want the give me the haunted room please or go on a ghost tour and they're like and they say that if you yell down that hole then you know it'll come and get you hello i want something interesting to happen please nothing's ever really happened i've had what i had a bad dream as a kid that i was convinced i'd seen a ghost but i know it was a bad dream there's too many cases of people where it's like that is the haunted chair where anyone who sits there has an in incredible feeling of dread yeah it turns out that the frequency of the fan above was interacting with the motor of the fridge and when you, they removed both of those that feeling of uh, dread went away because it turned out that the infrastronic harmony that was being generated between those two points was resonating in people's bones like there's, there's been too many cases where that and no real cases where it's not i profoundly mean it when i say i would love something supernatural to happen to me because the ability to look at the entire world with a fresh set of eyes is not something that you get very often but I'd, i am a skeptic i'm afraid sunny geordie asks why do you do art what are you trying to do with it i do art because i can't not it's a slight compulsion at my end if i'm not creating something i go wrong i i, I can't explain it i either spiral into something approaching like depression or my identity falls apart it's hard to explain like my, my self-worth self-identity kind of implodes because as much as i preach you are not what you create on an emotional level i still fundamentally believe it because of how i got here i guess in terms of the positive sides though you know what am i working to achieve one this was never my original goal but the creative industries do not need to be as exploitative i guess as they as they have been you can make things without sacrificing people i guess is part of it but in terms of what am i trying to do with it for me i've made a good piece of art if someone engages with it reevaluates things and then either improves their own life or improves other people's as a re as a result of it i think that art is a very useful space for exploring potential in a way that doesn't threaten people and i mean that both in the sense of threatening people as like hey let's go build this thing you can threaten people's jobs like they can be they can, they can be made destitute if that thing just goes off look at look, look at rampant automation as a problem but on the flip side you don't want to just preclude people from ever considering future pos possibilities or potential you know or different ways of looking at the world or stepping in other people's shoes and seeing the world as it is from a different perspective and art allows you to do that in a way that doesn't have a cost to anyone but you and again this is a very humanist stance where you know oh art's all art subjective and blah, blah blah that hasn't always been the case like people think that now it might change the idea is you consume art not just as a product it's not like, it's not a chair that you sit in it is something that allows you to be presented a thought that is in someone else's head and then use it to modify your own thought patterns and if you do it in a mindful way instead of consuming media like it's junk food you can implement positive change in both yourself and others a because i can't not and that is as odd as it sounds and the other one is yeah i think it's if i've got to do it anyway because i can't not the least that we can do is use it to improve the human condition and well the condition of everything really last question bit of a tonal shift lil piss boy asks why do we only ever get to see you in a suit do you have something against casual clothing i'm happy to answer this no one's ever actually asked me this directly i was raised that wearing a suit is not a signifier of status it is a mark of respect for the person that you're speaking to and as a result, I've spent a long time with that secretly kind of built into my head. So anytime I was dealing with business stuff on behalf of other people, I would wear a suit because they deserve to be represented by someone who is taking it seriously. You don't get to be lazy on camera. You don't get to be like, oh, hey, yeah, whatever. Because people are giving you their time, their attention. Like some of them are giving you their money and stuff like they deserve that respect first it was that as it became a joke i was happy to lean into that further a little bit however as you'll notice 
it isn't always always the case but yeah in terms of why do i you always see me in suit because i respect you i respect you as people and so as a result i i need to show that respect to you and that's one of the ways that i can do it and so there you go although retrospectively i have been told now that i have worn a turtleneck therefore i want to be steve jobs which is not the case please god no i hope i've answered everything as fulsomely as i can as always, I'll apologise if there are some hard edits in there. It'll either be because I accidentally talked about something I shouldn't. Normally that's the case. Or, uh, I don't know, I walked off camera or something. You know, just forgot. Forgot I was being filmed. But apart from that, that is everything. Uh, thank you all so much, everyone, to round it out for charitable giving. We did an enormous amount for charity last year. And God knows there's enough going on at the moment that that kind of generosity kind of rings even truer. It's a really big deal. And it's very well done of all of you. And I love that we get to do that. And I love that I get to give something, e even if it's small like this, in return to just acknowledge your contributions to something that's very impressive. So thank you to all of you. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. If you've made it this far, I'm assuming no one has, but you never know. Just keep being cool. Look after yourselves. Be well, be nice. And keep, keep doing you, because you're doing a good job. All right? Bye, everyone.